Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is Seth Polanski, Vice President, Corporate Communication for the World Series of Poker and Caesars Interactive Entertainment. We'll be talking about the upcoming World Series of Poker, which begins later this month. Seth Polanski, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thanks, gentlemen. Great to be back. This year, the World Series has 78 bracelet events. How does this compare with former years? Yes, this is the most events we've ever had in one series. Last year, we were at 74, but we had a record 121,000 entries last year across our events, awarded over $231 million in prize money. So our schedule is really just a reflection of the demand we're trying to meet. 121,000 entries? Correct. Well, that's not 121,000 individual people. No, of course not. But still, that's that's pretty amazing. That's... It is. Yeah, poker's really uh, exploded. I mean, we're getting, we're seeing people from China now coming in regularly. And uh, a lot of European countries in South America, there's growth coming from around the world in poker. And despite it not maybe being as popular mainstream these days, the reality is that the chess and backgammon, all those games, the game today that players are competing in and challenge themselves is poker. Is it waning in the U.S. or flat, or is it still growing? Well, it can't be still growing, can it? Yeah, no, it's not growing. It's tailed off a little bit, uh, I would even say uh, slightly uh, below flat. Um, it's hard to get new players into the game today. Esports has been good competition in video games, and just the fact with uh, cell phones, smartphones, um, all the social gaming you can do on your device, there are a lot of options for people today but ultimately most of those folks end up graduating into poker if they have that sort of competitive mind sport game mentality what is the status of online poker in nevada and how will that affect the world series yes the great news uh states of new jersey and nevada just linked together for the very first time so online poker in the u.s is only a three market business today delaware new jersey and nevada but up until today, New Jersey and Nevada were in their own separate pools, meaning if you're in the borders of Nevada, you only got to play with other people in Nevada. Same for New Jersey. But the regulatory bodies in the three states, along with the government in those states, have worked out a deal where we can offer interstate online poker. And now the... Um, the sites have joined together as one, and now players from New Jersey and Nevada are playing each other for the first time, and people in New Jersey can win online World Series of Poker Gold bracelets from the comfort of their home, things like that. So Pennsylvania is supposed to launch later this year with online gaming, and if they join this pool, all of a sudden you do have a meaningful, probably about 25 million people with access to online poker. And did, did that happen? We're recording on May 1st. Did that happen today, May 1st? It took effect today. We got uh, regulatory approval yesterday from all states and went live today. And did you see any uh, noticeable jump in? Unbelievably, already uh, much better, almost instantaneous. And it's surprising to us because there's some hurdles for people in Nevada. They had to, we had to kick them off their existing software. They had to download new software, re-register, redeposit, go through some hoops because they're technically joining the New Jersey platform because the servers are based in New Jersey and that's what the requirements were. So, um, but people have gone through. We had a pre-registration period the past week and people signed up and uh, we're off and running and the good sign. So prize pools now are going to be, we're having a $200,000 Sunday tournament prize pool here coming up. And uh, this is now going to be meaningful amounts of money that people will get back in and playing this. Now, WSOP has their own online platform. Are there still competitors? Forgive me because I'm not up on online poker. Are there still competitors or are you the only ones? Nevada, we're the only ones still operating. Well, I should take that back. South Point does have an offering as well. Um, so it's us in South Point in Nevada. In New Jersey, there's much more competition. There's eight. Uh, sites offering online poker, but 
WSOP.com is the only one that's linked Nevada and New Jersey since we're the only operator with businesses in both. So we should be able to get a, a good amount of market share from New Jersey who's playing on the other sites to come over to us simply because players will go where the money is and the opportunity to make more for a small investment will be better with us than what they can currently get. So if you're a resident of, and actually physically say in Trenton, New Jersey, you can compete in the Nevada, the World Series of Poker this year without leaving your hometown. Is that correct? That's correct. How, how does that work? I mean, it's a World Series event, but it's just online? Yeah, we have 78 events, and of the 78, four are online-only events. So they'll be able to compete in those four events from where they are. Of course, we also do a lot of satelliting into the land-based event. So we award seats to online players to com compete in the live event. That's our good cross-marketing opportunity, and a lot of people take advantage of that. So a lot of people will win their seats that way, whether in New Jersey or Nevada. But then they would physically come to Nevada to, to Correct. physically compete. Correct. Help the tourism come stay in our hotels and and uh, be regular tourists. All right. So compared to last year, what events have been added and what's, what events have been subtracted? Uh, there really hasn't been too many tweaks from last year to this. We had three online events last year. We have four this year. We tweaked a couple other events. Um, the big difference this year to last year is we have 13 events starting after our main event. So main event has been traditionally the last event on our schedule. And once you've either been eliminated from that event or are still competing, there's no other events for you to enter to enter into. But this year, we're, we're going to run 13 events post the start of the main event. So the main event starts July 2nd this year, and our doors are open until July 17th. So people will be able to play play um, after the fact, and we're going to see how that goes. There's kind of been this mentality, oh, you bust out of the main event, that's it, that's my summer. We're going to see by adding some special events, including a million-dollar buy-in event that's on the schedule. Million-dollar buy-in. Buy-in event, that's correct. And that comes after the main event? Correct. So we hope a couple guys become millionaires in the main event and then uh, flip into the what we call the big one-for-one one drop, our charity $1 million buy-in event. And do you, do you, what are you hoping, how many entries are you hoping to see in that? We cap it at 48. We got that the first year we offered it. I think the, the next time we did was uh, 42. But it's around that 40-ish ilk. Um, a, a mixture of, of businessmen, mainly charitable guys, and and the few poker pros who've got the the funds to compete. Well, while we're talking about that big big one for one drop, this is the fourth time we've had this, but only the third time at the World Series. So it went away from the World Series, and now it's coming back. How did that work? The third edition of it uh, became an invite only event. Some of the businessmen. And philanthropists who competed um, preferred to play without the amount of pros. So in the Las Vegas version, you have all the pro players in town, and some of them pooled their money together and and sort of uh, backed each other to get into the event and play. The organizer of this event, Guy La Liberté, uh, the Cirque du Soleil founder, uh -huh. and and he is uh, the founder of One Drop, the charity we do the work for. Uh, he was getting pressure from his businessmen friends to do a invitation-only event. So we moved the event to Monte Carlo in concert with a couple other big uh, international events that were going on there and gave it a whirl there. There were a lot of European players whose schedule didn't work to come over to Las Vegas, so we thought moving to uh, Monte Carlo would work. It's an every-other-year event for us, so we started this in 2012, so this year, 2018, will, will be our fourth running of it. And it's back to an open event that anyone can play. Does your crystal ball say it will stay here, or will go back and forth between Monte Carlo and here, or does your crystal ball a little bit cloudy on that? Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, the reality is it's a very exclusive company, group of guys who can play in this event, right? And you want to cater to what works for them. And sometimes our timing of this event with the WSOP is an ideal. So we had a fall event in Monte Carlo that seemed to work better 
for guys in their calendar there. So we'll do what's in the best interest of making this a successful event. We typically raise four to five million dollars for charity as part of this event. That's our main motivation. But the winner walks away. You know, the first one was eighteen million dollars. Next year I won fifteen million dollars. So significant money too. And uh, most people will find the game if they're that interested in playing. Now there's been a slight price decrease on this event which sounds surprising that went from one 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 to uh, a flat million now that seems prices always go up they never go down <laughs> what happened here yeah well we were cute with the pricing to begin with because we partnered with the one drop organization so we took the theme of one and ran it through everything we did but now that we're five years into the partnership, we've raised over $20 million for charity in that time. People understand one drop and what it means. So we felt we didn't need sort of, I don't want to call it a gimmick, but sort of the marketing hook of what it was. And it's just easier for guys to, you know, wire over a million dollars and keep it clean and simple uh, that way. All right. Big blind ante. Eight of the events are going to feature that. How is this different from the normal way of anteing? Yeah, so this is interesting. It's it's taken hold in poker. You know, it's not often new things come out that really uh, get everyone excited. Players, operators, dealers, you know, across the board. Essentially, the way poker works now, if the, if the game has antes, each player has to put in a chip every hand to play that hand. As most guys know, play poker, whether it's a home game or not, there's always one guy at the table who forgets to put his ante. There's always another guy at the table that's distracted uh, on his phone or doing something else and can't remember if he did or not and gets into an argument with the guy next to him whether he did or didn't. And it takes three minutes for everyone to get their chips in the pot and the dealer to collect them. Big blind ante is a new creation where the person in the big blind pays everyone's antes. So what ends up happening is if you're at a table of nine people, instead of anting every hand, one in every nine hands, you'll put in the equivalent of everyone's ante. So it, it equates to the exact same. The math really doesn't change in the game, but now you're actually speeding things up, eliminating these fights, keeping the dealer from having to go around and collect everyone's antes because they're in one place and just make things smoother. But... Well, it's, when it gets shorthanded, small blind's going to go all in a lot more often. Yeah, there. Uh, so it it changes thing. Five handed. There's some discussion. We we've tested this out in our circuit events, and other people are testing it. And there is some, you know, griping on whether it's fair at that stage of the tournament. We're going to roll it out this year in eight events at different price points at each price point level that we offer to gauge how it impacts that audience. The World Series of Poker has a lot of recreational players, a lot of um, amateurs and people, hobbyists just play one game. They may not be familiar with this format. We want to introduce it slowly. But what's happened is the people who have played Big Blind Annie, they're bored to tears when they have to go back to regular anti-poker. It we, just seems so slow. We went to this 45 years ago in our home games for all the reasons you said. I mean, it's just so much faster. You don't have the arguments about you didn't ante. Yes, I did. I threw it over there. You know, and, and no matter how many times you would tell the people, put the ante in front of you, don't splash the pot with it. Guys would throw it and then they would be, well, no, that was my chip over there. Yeah, so it's just so much Faster, cleaner, easier to do it this way. Where were you, Richard, when I was uh, 45 years ago? I wish we knew because I do. That's how it, it feels to me. If someone was creating the game today, it would be Big Blind Annie. There'd be no discussion or concern. Everyone would understand that's the most sensible way to do it. Yeah. Although really kind of the creation of blinds was sort of initially instead of the anti system. Um, and but... You guys do both in some of these events, which I guess, you know, you're trying to keep things moving and leveling up. And Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you're right. Anytime anyone's putting anything into the pot, it's a forced action when, we're, when it's a blind or an ante. So they're required to do that. And then after that, they're volunteering whether they want to contest this pot or not. Um, but what's happened in poker is everyone wants so many chips to start 
and the levels have gotten so long. Like the players have had a good impact on making these events not crapshoots, but actual events of skill. Our events are structured to last 30 hours of play. This is three days, 10 hours of play a day with all the breaks and everything out. You're, you're there for 12, 13 hours a day. And if you're going to win this event, you're going to put in 36 hours, you know, at, at the tables playing it. So that's how we come up with what's the right amount of time. And then all the, the structures of the event and how to do the blinds uh, go back to that. So it's trickier. Poker used to be as like one one day and six hours or four hours they tried to get it. That was a long time then. Now it's grown to three days. Okay. We mentioned briefly the big one for one drop. But in addition to that, what other high roller events arbitrarily defined as more than $10,000 to enter will you have this year? And how does this compare with earlier years? Yes, 10,000 is still too rich for me, but I understand. So we have uh, 12 events that are at the 10,000 price point, but above that point has been an area of increased demand of our players. It's something that a segment of the players want to compete in. So we have um, the $25,000 buying event this year, two of them, a 50,000, uh, two $50,000 buying events, a $100,000 buying event, and the million dollar buying event. So out of 78 events, there's five catered to, to that club uh, pretty exclusively. And then we have a separate cash game lounge where we're running some weekend tournaments with twenty five and $50,000 buy-in one day events too. So for the high roller guy who's looking for those stakes, we think we've got a great offering this summer to meet that demand. And where does the horse uh, fall in the schedule? Yeah, it's, it's, and that's fifty, right? Yeah, that's fifty thousand. Um, it's the what we call the Poker Players Championship. So we play eight different games uh, of poker to basically our all around best player is the way we look at it. Uh, the champion of this event. So that's that's in the middle of June this year. It takes five days uh, to play that event out from beginning to end, and uh, you know that's only about a hundred players. That play in that event, but it's the biggest names and the, and the best of the game, and that that's typically the one event besides the main event that every uh, pro poker player wants to win and add to the resume. Every year, World Series of Poker announces a Player of the Year. The formula for this appears to be changing. So, how is the new formula different than what it was last year, and why? And would the winners of past years have? been different under the new formula compared to the formula that was in effect at that time. Sure. So the impetus of this, we've changed the formula this year again. Um, we had backlash from sort of the pro player contingent that we were overweighting just getting into cashing the events, the minimum buyout. So we pay out 15% of the field. And they thought the people that were getting into the 13 to 15% area were getting awarded too many points compared to first place. So instead of a ratio of about six to one first place to a min casher, that's going up to about 20 to one this year. The winner last year and the winner under this formula that we're introducing would have been the same because the guy who won, Chris Ferguson, cashed in 23 events, won a bracelet, final table to another event. Had a great summer. He played consistently well, had some deep finishes, but the complaint with our system from a segment of the population was it was rewarding cashing and not rewarding wins and going to final tables. So the system now is tweaked to reward that segment. Now, if you ask me, we're not going to satisfy everyone. There's going to be a group of people that say, hey, a player of the year to me is a guy that does consistently well all the time. Is Russell Westbrook the MVP? Is James Harden the MVP? Is LeBron James the MVP? What's your criteria? What are you judging it on? How he helps his team win, his individual stats, his how he excels in one area of basketball to the end there. So I think with a player of the year, no matter how we do it, there's going to be some controversy, and I, I consider that good. Let people debate and discuss the merits of what it should be. But at the end of the day, the right guy won the award last year, and under the new system, we, we still think it'll end up in the same way. Is, is it um, divided in any way by the number of events they're in? 
or that's what's tricky you get points based on individual events so um you could do well in a player of the year system simply by playing in a in a significant number of events right we have 78 in the summer and we have 10 more at europe that count for our player of the year so if you if you have the bankroll to fire in 60 events and the math is going to tell you if you cash in a decent amount of them you'll get enough points where we had guys who did great but played five tournaments cashed in four won a bracelet final table another event that's pretty darn good too right so it depends some guys just view that as not uh, had a lucky streak here had a good week make it sustain over eight weeks make it sustain over 80 events not eight um and i think it's just a, a matter of opinion for similar field size does a ten thousand dollar entry fee event have the same number of points as say a one thousand dollar event yeah, it's going to be comparable. The The formula takes into account the number of entries in the event and the prize pool. So typically... Yeah, the number of entries seems more relevant than, than, the, pri than, than the amount of buy-in. Yeah, I would make the argument, you know, Danny Negreanu was adamant that if he finished ninth in a $10,000 buy-in event that had 100 entries, he did better than a guy who finished 100th in a 10,000-player field. I would disagree with that assessment, right? This guy outlasted 9,900 players in this field and made it to the final 1%. Daniel, finishing ninth <coughs> out of 100, made it to the final 10% of the event. So I think the math tells you that the other guy did better, but Daniel believes there should be a weighted measure for the skill level, the participants believing that the hundred players he played against in a ten thousand dollar buy an event are higher skill level and thus harder to navigate through. Well, by that logic, then would he say he should get less points if he wins the one drop because the skill level is lower with all the businessmen in it? Right. I mean, it, that's why this is a never-ending argument, and depending yeah. on which side of the coin you're on, you, you can argue it successfully either way. So at the end of the day, I mean. A player of the year is a great achievement for any poker player. They want to win it. They get a banner uh, that will adorn the hallways of the tournaments for years to come following their victory. But it's a subjective award, and there's no real way based on It's not fair to take a guy whose bankroll only limits him to playing eight events and not giving him a shot against a guy like Daniel who can play 50 events if he chooses and do it. But at the end of the day, we feel good about what we put in this year. We tweaked it, but at the same time, the guy who won it last year who did it on consistency and one bracelet victory would have won if it was using this formula. You have a number of events bringing in many, many players, such as Giant Colossus, where rebuys and stuff like that. So um, are these the same as last year? Are they different? There are more of them? What? Uh, similar amount. I mean, we only have a, a certain number of weekends. What we do is we really cater the weekend events to the recreational player, where we try to have low buy-in events with big prize pools for them to compete in and recognize that they have limited time commitments and most of these people have jobs and don't have a long length of time to compete. So uh, we have a $365 buy-in event, a $565 buy-in event, $888 buy-in event, $1,000 buy-in event. And these events, are you're seeing a million dollars being awarded for first place and $10, $11, 12000000 million prize pools that they're competing for. So this has really been the secret sauce of the success of the WSOP. The last half decade or so is creating these what we call tentpole events give them a gimmicky name that sticks, let people circle it on their calendar and make plans to come out. Because this is what we know about people. They want to invest a little and win as much as possible. I mean, when you can spend $565 and three days later walk away with a million dollars, that's compelling and appealing 
to a lot of people. And we run satellites for $50 that you can get entry into the event. So you're finding guys get in for $50 and getting six figure scores out of it. So the idea is pretty simple. Make these mass market events, make them low buy-in, try to generate large prize pools by offering either more chips to start or a guaranteed first place prize or a guaranteed prize pool. And it's really worked to uh, get people in and uh, and competing. And are these all no limit hold'em or would they ever be a different game? We've started to do it with Pot Limit Omaha, PLO, which has become the second most popular game that we offer. So there is a variant that does that. It's not quite there yet. Um, like we'd run it on a Friday or a Sunday as opposed to um, a Friday, sa Saturday, multi-day start for some of the bigger events. Um, but uh, those are probably the two only games that support it. It's just simply a matter of the popularity of the games and the people that play them. All right, we're talking to Seth Polanski on this year's World Series of Poker. We're going to resume that in a few seconds. First, we have some commercials to talk to you about. The South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. From now through May 24th, from Monday through Thursday, you may earn 300 points between 3 a.m. and 11 p.m. and earn a spin at the kiosk. The prizes include 2,500 or 5,000 points, worth $750 or $15 respectively, free buffets, for breakfast or lunch, $10 food, $25 resort credit, uh, and $15.25 or $50 in free play. You keep your points. Mondays remain senior days. For those 50 years of age and older, you get half price meals using points, half price movies, and a free slot tournament. On Monday, May 28th, there will be a hot seat promotion all day long with you earning $100 at randomly chosen on a regular basis um, if you're playing. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is 100 play with quick quads. Quick quads is a six coin per line game where you get paid for four of a kind, a quad, when you have a three of a kind and the other two cards add up to the rank of the trips, such as four, 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 deuce, deuce, or eight, 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 seven, ace. I've played quick quads a lot and enjoy it more than most other video poker variants. Playing it in the hundred play version, should it ever come about with a decent pay schedule, would be a very pleasant experience. All right. We are back talking to Seth Polanski. Next question will be about television coverage. You have, uh, you're going to cover both the main event and the big drop for one drop event. Any other coverage? We will have live streaming all summer of our final tables on our partner Poker Go. Um, they'll do somewhere between 40 and 50 uh, final tables this summer. So virtually every day from June 1st to July 17th, poker aficionados will be able to find some content emanating of the World Series of Poker. But it all concludes with 15 straight days of coverage on ESPN from July 2nd to 17th. So they'll cover every day of the main event and the uh, big one for one drop tournament as well. So we've never had 15 consecutive days of coverage on ESPN. It's a huge commitment on their part. We're really excited. We actually tweaked our schedule start dates a bit to fit in line with their broadcast windows that they had available for us. But, um, you know, there's not much poker on television these days. And for us to get 15 days on the preeminent sports network in the country, it's great for our audience and great for growing poker. How many hours a day are they going to be on? It varies. It'll be anywhere from two to seven hours, depending on the day. And the coverage, and, and some of it will depend on and how we're going. They will cover every hand of the main event final table and of the big one for one drop final table. And then they'll come in in uh, two to four hour blocks primarily on the early day coverage of the main event. On the live streaming, is this going to be a 15-minute delay, a 30-minute delay, or do you know? 
We use 30 minute delay. That's just a standard uh, delay. Uh, I think Nevada Gaming would let us get away with a little less, but it's just most comfortable to have enough of a window built in. Uh, some hands take, they shouldn't take that long, but sometimes there are circumstances that they get drawn out and we just want to make sure there's never a case where live hole cards are being shown uh, to per participants. So the truth of the matter is when you're watching at home, you have it feels live and that's the most important thing. They get the hole cards, they get all the information of what's going on in the hand, even though technically it completed 30 minutes earlier. What's the deal on the clock this year? Uh, there is a shot clock being introduced into a few of the high roller events. There has been some complaints that poker has gotten too slow, that players take too much time in making decisions and slow down the game. The truth of the matter is the World Series of Poker is a little different. We get a lot of amateur participation, and uh, it's a fun uh, experience. They pick we, Our average person plays in 1.7 events. They're not out here for long periods of time, and they're not playing a lot of events. So it's important for us to be mindful of, of them and what their experiences are. Most of these guys have never played with a shot clock, and they're really not the ones slowing down the game. It's usually the pros going through all the possible combinations and thoughts of what's happened. So we're introducing shot clocks into some of the high roller events because that seems to be the preference of that group. Um, but we're not going to roll it out wide because we don't believe uh, that's our market. We don't want to put pressure on players to make decisions. I mean, baseball, I tried to get my seven-year-old son into watching baseball. It's way too slow for him. And it does feel like they need to do something to pick up the pace of play. It's really hard in poker, you know, if you want to institute a 30 second shot clock let's say that each player has 30 seconds to act well if there's nine players at a table that's four and a half minutes per round of betting right and then you have how many rounds of betting pre-flop post-flop turn river right four times four and a half minutes i mean now you're talking 18 minutes and the dealing hand closing hand 20 minutes the average hand is over in three minutes in the way it goes now so we fear about putting in a shot clock is actually going to get everyone to be robots and say well i better sit here for 29 seconds before i make a decision because if i do it earlier someone's going to get information on me and they think they're going to be giving them tells giving them information of when he folds within 10 sec or when he calls within 10 seconds it's because he's got a good hand but if he waits till 20 to 30 seconds he's got a mediocre hand. so they will get to the point where they'll all do the same thing so they don't give out any information, and then we'll be playing 18-minute hands. So we don't think it's great for poker. Um, we've instituted instead rules that give us leeway, both dealers and floor staff, to come over to the table and speed up games if we think there's deliberate stalling or someone doing something. It um, seems like shouldn't. some people want more television time, so they, you know, they take more time, just, especially if they're on a game that's on television. But the other problem is, as a, as the audience, when you were editing the shows in the past, you could cut out all of that dead, dead air. Um, whereas if you're going just live with a thirty minute delay. We're going to see a lot of sitting around. Yeah, so you're absolutely right, Richard. It is. It became a problem at the main event final table, not this past year, but in the previous couple of years, we had one guy in particular at each of those tables that took an inordinate amount of time making his decisions. And of course, when you're sitting at home and you see his hole cards and he's holding an eight of clubs and a two of diamonds, you know he's not playing the cards. Just throw them in and be done. But instead, he was... Hollywooding, like you say, playing the cameras. But it that's a bad outcome for everyone, right? The viewers don't want to watch that. Yeah. The broadcaster doesn't want to televise it. We don't want to see it. Yet at the same time, they're showing that. That's with eight guys left in the main event, and they're all playing for a million dollars or more. We don't want to be the ones to arbitrarily force them to make decisions or bad decisions because they were pressured by sort of these outside forces to do so. So we would approach that individual and we spoke to him and tried to get him to speed up play or would penalize him if 
we felt he was doing it incessantly or whatever. But to, to put a shot clock in is really fundamentally changing how everyone has to approach the game. Your example of 18 to 20 minutes assumed nine players saw all five streets, which is something that never happens. That's a bad assumption. You're right. My math wasn't... Uh, so it's... Um, I mean, it's technically possible, worst case scenario, but it's not something that was. Um, no, but know. his point is well taken. That you're right. The players are going to use every second of it to, in fear that they would be giving up tells if they didn't. Yeah, the average player takes less than five seconds to make his decision. Uh, if he's folding, it's less than that. If he's not, it takes a little more time to either count out his chips look around and see, you know, make some decisions based on where he is at the table and what he sees kind of thing. And and that should be allowed. We want people to feel comfortable in the decision they're making and, and not make the wrong decision because of the, the pressure. That said, we want to be in the entertainment business and we want to make sure that everyone's having a good time and guys who are incessantly slow are annoying whether you're in the line at the grocery store or at the poker table. A woman selling a book wants to play in one or more World Series events dressed as a man. You have been quoted as saying that the World Series of Poker is opposed to this and will stop it if it can. While I suspect you will be successful at stopping this should you su employ sufficient resources, it seems as though the woman will gain publicity for her book with whatever happens. Why is this a battle worth waging for the World Series of Poker? Well, look, we wish we didn't have to deal with it, but you're right. This is really a publicity stunt, and any time we talk about it, we're only helping her sell books. The issue for us has nothing to do with that. It's an integrity issue for us. It has nothing to do with gender or trying to be bad sports as someone's trying the social experiment or trying to sell books, whatever it may be. We require every player who registers to provide identification. We have to make sure that player who registers is the player who is playing. So no one wants, well, a lot of people would like to play the event for two days, get a lot of chips, and then turn it over to Phil Ivey to, to play the rest of the tournament for them. It, it can't happen, right? We, we have to make sure it's fair for all players and that we know who's sitting there and that person's been there throughout the event and nothing is going on that's going to impact the integrity or give any player put any players at a disadvantage or an advantage based on that so for us uh, we have a rule you can't conceal your face no mask no identity protection we have to know you come to the table we verify your identification that you are and that sort of thing so we're simply we have nothing against this woman or what she's trying to do but it is a violation of our rules and we can't allow a publicity stunt to impact uh, and, and open a can of worms where the integrity of our events can be put into question. So do you verify people's ID at the table before the start of play every day? We do, and separately when they register for the event. So you're, and you can be asked and have to provide identification even when you move tables um, and such. So... It's an, it's an important aspect of keeping the integrity of the event for all the participants. And uh, it's just something that if we made an exception here, then the next exception is someone having Phil Ivey play for them. Well, uh, there was an incident where Phil Locke showed up dressed as an old man with makeup and stuff to look like someone else. Which fooled nobody. Yeah. <laughs> right, that's true. It didn't <laughs> fool anyone, but that, that was the impetus for our rule change. Uh, it was 2006, 2007 or something, and then the rule went into effect uh, to conceal the identity. So, um, but people are allowed to wear hoodies and sunglasses, right? Yes. As long as we get us, uh, we can figure out who you're like a guy came in a jack-in-the-box hat last year okay he's just trying to get on tv have a little fun wants a picture on the job we let him for a minute take his picture with his jack-in-the-box hat on and then he had to take it off and play the rest of the the rest of the way it's just simply for any player's benefit so they know who they're playing against and that it's that same person throughout the event but if this woman has a, a driver's license from whatever state she's from 
with her in whatever disguise she wants to wear, then she will match the ID, and so she's going to be allowed to do this. Is that correct? I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. It it seems hard to fathom that you can slow show up to registration, prevent ID. You're going to have to match all the way through, or it's going to be called in question. What what I tried to explain to her and her people is she's going to lose her ten thousand dollar buy in. You know, if she gets disqualified from the event, and it happens whether we catch her the first five minutes into the first day or on day three at some point well but if she's if all she's doing is wearing a hoodie and sunglasses she's doing nothing wrong that's correct and if if people at the table just sort of make assumptions about whether she's a man or a woman well that there's no problem with that's it. correct so, look caesar's is very good we tolerate everyone this has nothing to do with your gender your background your identity how you want to dress how you want to appear all those things are fine but the actual game of poker and to ensure the rules to make sure that nothing affects the integrity of the event, we have to be able to identify you and you have to match all the way through the event. On the online, how are how are you going to match that? And now, how are you going to match the ID of somebody who's in? Uh... Well, when you sign up online, you have to give your social security number, right? Yeah, you're I mean... giving us a lot of information. Um, and obviously you have usernames, you have passwords, you have geolocations, so you have a lot of things. Can I ultimately, if Bob, you give Richard your password and your information, could he play under your account? The assumption is yes. But we also know your IP address. We also are doing cell phone triangulation. We have your address and where you live. So there are ways to understand whether this is abnormal play because we're looking out for fraud. We're looking out for people getting their accounts. Well, there seems a significant so. potential for fraud in when when they're in a different location. Given that I'm, uh, I have no poker skills at all, and now I can't imagine me uh, Phil Ivy wanting to be associated with anything like this. Of of me paying him sufficient money that would that would interest him. I it's I uh, I don't believe. But presumably, for a price, he would be willing. Um, and I'm saying this not knowing Phil at all and not casting any aspersions on him whatsoever. But uh, that would not be possible. Uh, Phil and I look considerably different in person. But if he's sitting at my computer at my home, we look the same. The difference is live poker and online poker are two different animals. You get all the live reads of someone in person. Are they putting out their chips with their left hand exclusively? Are they twitching their eyes? Is their, you know, ear moving when they do things? Are they showing signs of nervousness? Is their leg shaking? I mean, all those things good players are looking out for and making decisions based on what they get repeated reads of what guys are doing. Obviously, you have none of that in online poker. Online poker is pretty much a math game, right? You're playing the cards. You don't even know your opponent's well enough to discern maybe you've played with him a few times you recognize the screen name and remember he sucked out on you in a pot or whatever the case may be but the reality is it's it's for us for players they deserve in live poker to know who you are in online poker you have screen names like you know you don't have to play as yourself you can come up with whatever screen name of course on the back end we know who you really are and our monitor and gameplay and that sort of thing one bottleneck in a big tournament is registering. Will there be any shortcuts to that this year compared to last year? And does having diamond or seven star status within the total reward system help you out, Heaney? I'll answer your second question first. Yes, having a reward status helps you. We have special line for diamond customers and above to register for events. Um, we do have an online registration system that we introduced last year that's back this year. It's a very good system. If players want to avoid lines, they can fund their account, in essence, online, buy, you know, pay for their tournaments in advance and just show up. There's Nevada statute. We have to verify a person's identity like we were talking about before. So you do have a your first time at the WSOP that year. We verify who you are. We verify your ID. We verify everything's valid. And then from that point on, every other tournament you buy into, you never have to visit the registration cage again. We have kiosks like airline uh, 
kiosk that you print out your seat card and receipt and go on your way. So the issue is most players don't register online in advance. They hang on to their money and uh, they try to satellite in and they do whatever. So um, at the end of the day, there's an element of Disneyland to the World Series of Poker, right? Sometimes there's uh, um, lines for the longer rides that are popular at Disneyland, and we have the same situation when you're trying to get 10,000 players into an event. Uh, it's going to take a little longer. But the process has uh, been refined, and there's always tweaks. We're always adding cashier windows. We're always streamlining where we can. And the truth of the matter is there has not been many examples the past couple of years with this being an issue like we once dealt with. When we first had, we had 22,000 players for an event when we first ran the Colossus. We expected 8,000. We got caught off guard, and that was problematic uh, through all the operations. Well, it only takes once to to uh, find a fix to make sure that doesn't happen again, and things have been pretty smooth the past couple of years. It's probably too late to make some substantive substantive changes to the 2018 World Series, but let's assume a player or media member has an idea that would make the tournament better going forward. What's the responsible way to communicate that to your committee so that it might be considered? The truth of the matter is a lot of the great ideas come from the poker playing community. They're playing a lot. They understand what's working, what isn't, what the friction points are, what their frustrations are and offer us a lot of uh, good ways to address it. So there's really no bad way to come at us, whether you're in person to come tell. The best thing to do is find the supervisor in the area you're in if you're playing poker and have either a problem or an idea. Um, but if you're not with us, we're very active on social media via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can reach out to us, and all our executives are... You can email or call anytime. And, uh, you know, in the past month, we've made some meaningful changes to uh, events, whether it be the structure of events or starting chips for an event or even the price points of events. We've tweaked some things like we, we had buy ins for our daily deep stacks that are really popular. They're one day events. They're not official World Series of Poker events. But for those guys that have eight hours to play, they want to do a small buy-in and win a lot. So we have a real popular at one o'clock every day. We have a $235 buy-in event. The winner usually wins about $60,000. I mean, this gets for a thousand players participating in it. Well, one guy said, well, why don't you charge 200 or 250? Just make it more round. Being at the cashier and having to have a 20 and a 10 and a five, and a, it just slows things down. Like I'd, I'd rather pay 250 than not or 200 or whatever. So it, it's right. I don't know our, you know, why the buy-ins were created, what they were, but we made some tweaks there and, and things like that. And we'll always, we'll always listen to the player feedback. And if we can implement, we will. Players would rather pay 300 than 265. Yes, because the reality is the majority of it goes to the prize pool. I mean, it's their money that they're competing for. So at the end of the day, if it... Uh, I'm sure it speeds up the line if it's 300 over 265. Yeah. All right. Now, I was a math major way back when. So since this is the 49th World Series of Poker, I've been able to figure out that next year's will be the 50th. I'm so smart. Presumably, you guys are making going to make a big deal about it being your 50th. Are there any announcements yet as to how next year's event will be bigger, better, or whatever else? I'm glad we have a math major here because I am not one. So maybe you can solve this for us. Is it our 50th birthday next year? Our 50th anniversary? I mean, I need your help because I'm the same age as the WSOP. I was born in 1970, but I'm only 48. We'll be at the 49th annual World Series of Poker this summer. And I know I won't turn 50 until 2020. So is next year, 2019, the 50th what? It will be the 50th annual WSOP, but is that an anniversary, a birthday? How do we celebrate this? And is next year the right year? Or like I'm celebrating my 50th birthday in 2020, should I be waiting a year? Well, I'm going to take your question at face value. <laughs> I'm uh, not sure how serious you are with it, but um, to answer your question, 
Next year will be the World Series of Poker's 49th birthday. It's also their 49th anniversary, but it will be your 50th annual event. I apologize if this all seems condescending, but that's where we're at here. Assume the tournament is a one-day affair, and the first one was held on the day you were born. One year later, you finally turn one year old, but it'll be the second annual tournament. One more year, now you are two years old, but it's the third annual tournament. So, 2019 will be the 49th birthday of the event and the 50th annual tournament. Calling it 50th annual is sexier than the 49th birthday, so I'm guessing you're going to call it the 50th annual. So, repeating the original question, do you have any announcements on what special things will happen during the 50th annual event? I need to ponder this because... I, we have to do some research. We do want to blow out our 50th. That would be smart, and I'm sure we can come up with some prizing and overlays and things that we can do. We have not discussed it yet, and I know there's actually, uh, whether it was the Super Bowl or someone, they, they got some grief, maybe for their 40th. They were calling it their 40th, but it was really the 40th annual, but not their 40th, whatever. So, I just got to make sure, and I'm hearing you now, 2020 will be our 50th birthday and 50th anniversary of the World Series But your 51st annual tournament. Right. This is what is so difficult because we've gone by the annual. We're calling this the 49th annual. Well, then next year would be the 50th annual. Yes. Yes. Right? So, yes. I Even, can't believe you guys aren't aware of this already and planning something. <laughs> this is uh, That's how bad we are. You can see I'm not a math major, so this is stumping. <laughs> okay. So, um So no plans, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> We're taking all submissions for ideas and when we should do it. All right. Very good. We uh maybe uh, you know, Caesar should buy the horseshoe and gut it and Set it up as a television stadium for poker. And there we go. There you go. Yeah, like Caesars we'll did. Downtown. Was 1966 is when Caesars opened. So they did some celebration in 2016, right? Yes. 50. So, so that's the annual. That's that's their birthday. But that's different than an annual event. I agree. So, uh, being someone as clever as you, I suggest that you have your fiftieth anniversary, your fiftieth annual event, and the next year have your fiftieth anniversary. Why not blow it out twice? Okay, so two years of celebration. Is that what we? Uh, I yeah. think that's what we're all agreed on. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I'll bring it back to the offices. All right. So since we're agreed on it, we're going to let Seth go. Uh, we thank you very much for answering our questions and for participating, and uh, hopefully we can do this again next year. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit a royal flush, everybody. Good day.